Um, hi, everyone. I am so honored to be uh, Jen Jennifer's interlocutor tonight. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, our connection really, um, how we met really plays into why I was selected um, by Jenny. Um, we met through uh, a breakup actually. Um, we shared a boyfriend in common and uh, and we actually, uh, I, I heard uh, through a six degrees of separation and New York City gossip as it happens that uh, we uh, were treated the same way by the guy. Um, so I sent Jennifer an, a Facebook message that said, don't worry, uh, it's not us, it's him. <laughs> and to which she replied the immortal word, martini? <laughs> and that is actually how we became friends. No joke. So I couldn't think of a, a better person to write this book. Uh, she's a consummate historian and uh, a fabulous friend. And this book really, um, it, it's, a, it's a friend to the reader. Um, I, I've had the chance to, to read it already. And it really talks a lot, despite being about horrendous things like heartbreak, it talks about uh, how we can find good things in this. Like th that's the takeaway, which is sort of extraordinary. So can you talk to me a little bit about what good things can come of breakups aside from us. I mean, us Us is a big one, so <laughs> that's a really nice one that I like a lot. But I think there's so many good things that can come out of breakups. It, it's it just the mic. Oh, am I, am I, can everybody hear me now? Is this, this is cool for people? Okay, great. Um, I think there are a ton of good things that people take away from breakups. I think there are many characters in this book whose lives are positively influenced by their breakups. Um, Oscar Kokoschka is one such example. He turns his heartbreak into a kind of art that we'll get to later. Edith Warden is an even better example who took the suffering that she experienced in her breakup with Morden Fullerton and turned it into some of her best novels and lives out her life on the French Riviera being like... She, she based example. her novel on her horrendous breakup. I mean, I'm not an Edith Warden scholar so I can't say absolutely she based it only on that breakup, but yeah, she did. <laughs> Between us, yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, you know, given the empowering messages in the book, um, there is a feminist reading to the book. Uh, you know, there are all these chicks who kick butt and uh, do really well after their breakups, and kick butt during their breakups, or, or sometimes get stabbed. But that's later in the book. Um, is this a feminist book? I think that's an interesting question, and I don't ever want to disown that label because I am a feminist. But to me, it's a very obvious humanist book. Like, I don't think there are men's rights activists out there saying, you should just stab your wife in the heart at a party. Like, if she gets <laughs> out of line, you should feel free to do that. So I think the people that I really come down hard on in this book are people who try to murder their spouses. <laughs> um, and to me, that, that feels like something we can all get behind. Now, for most of history, the people attempting to murder people are generally men because they're people in a position of power that allows them to say behead their wives when they don't like what they're doing or um, or just like suffolk a lot of wife killing a lot of wife killing in this book uh, face I, it we, we would if we could that we're just not men though <laughs> um, I mean one person that I wanted to get in there even though she's a little bit of a cheat Empress Anna Ivanovna of Russia her husband died after engaging in a drinking competition with her uncle which he never should have done like anybody can tell you not to drink with Peter the Great but um, but he died after that. It was two months after their wedding. And Anna Ivanovna just begged her family to let her remarry and ultimately became a very, very bitter, very eccentric woman, woman who forced her jesters to dress up as chickens. Um, and that's, that's, well, I mean... Chickens are funny. Well, not for the jesters. Yeah, like, that was, that was her full-time job. Um, and eventually forced... Um, two members of her court who she did not like to get married and have their honeymoon inside an ice palace where they almost froze to death. But they did not. They survived. 
so love turns you into a fire because it warms your heart. <laughs> but actually, the wife probably died later. She probably died as a result of that. Because of being forced into yeah, the ice castle. But I wanted Happens. to include Annie Ivnovna because she is a woman with power who almost immediately begins using her power to do terrible, terrible things. So I think it's not so much a question of men behave really badly and women are just really virtuous. It's a question of if you give people almost unlimited amounts of power at any point in time, people with unlimited power will use it to do crazy, terrible, awful things. Make you sleep in an ice castle. Make you sleep in an yeah, ice yeah. castle. No, I, yeah. I would. Yeah. Um, so, uh, look, um, you, you know my stories because they're your stories as well, having had more than one boyfriend in common. Uh, <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's easy to vilify your exes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so all my exes are psychopaths. They have no redeeming value. Like, it's unbelievable that they are, like, able to walk in a straight line, let alone They had date. really good taste in women. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yes, aside from that one redeeming quality, they're all terrible. Um, and uh, so it's easy to vilify uh, exes. But, you know... They have redeeming qualities. I have to admit it, even though I hate it. Tiger Woods, for example, you know, absolutely horrible husband, pretty fabulous golfer. Yeah, like, he, he can golf. Um, are, are there any redeeming value in any of these love villains that you've chronicled? Endlessly, all the time. Um, Henry VIII is pretty much the best person on the planet, except for his persistent wife killing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's the father of the British Navy, like a wonderful musician, a religious scholar, uh, just probably one of the most intelligent men of his age, but he just couldn't stop himself from beheading his wives, and that's all anybody remembers about him now. <laughs> so, and there were a lot of people like that. I think Ruskin is another great example of where I wanted to talk about Ruskin as a husband, and Ruskin's a very bad husband. Um, he supposedly saw his wife's pubic hair on the first night they were married, and refused to consummate the marriage. At a later trial, he told everyone that though she looked pleasing, there were actually things about her that would make anyone repulsive. The things her. being pubic hair. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And he told her when that, was that he'd try like again six years later. So Ruskin wasn't a great guy to be married to, but... What year was that, Jennifer? Um, that would have been in the Victorian age, so it would have been the early 1900s. Yeah, because that's like... I, I like read that on Gawker like last week. That's like... <laughs> I mean, seriously. The fact that he didn't want her because she had pubes. She was a human woman. I mean, people dispute it. There are a lot of Ruskin apologists that are like, actually, she probably like was made out of doll parts under her clothing. Yeah. So um, probably not, though. She married another guy after Ruskin, and they had eight children and seemed really happy so that was that was good news for them but Ruskin's a wonderful art critic and um, a philanthropist left a lot of his family's money to charity to building wonderful model homes so if I was looking at it from a perspective of great art critics Ruskin fits that perfectly he's just not a cool guy to be married to Got it. yeah well if you are a person with doll parts who has no pubes he's great uh, oh yeah no um yeah Got it. and you're in a Tim Burton movie now so that's nice perfect yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is one character um, in your book uh, who absolutely doesn't handle a breakup well. Um, he has he's pretty irredeemable for a, a good set of years <laughs> there. Um, do you want to talk about him? Do you want to read us a little bit um, about him? I, I, I disagree with you. I think Oscar Kokoschka is charming. So this is and Oscar Kokoschka, <laughs> the great Viennese artist um, <laughs> who was absolutely betrayed by uh, Alma Mahler, the great Viennese hottie. Uh, that was her claim to fame because she stupped everyone. <laughs> stupped is my people's way of saying had sex with. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and and he didn't take it so well when she... When she broke off their um, their love affair that he was enjoying a lot more than she was probably enjoying it. Um, Alma Mahler is really cool in her own right. She did have sex with pretty much everyone famous in Vienna. And uh, she was a composer in her own right, widow of Gustav Mahler, ended her life cavorting around with Leonard Bernstein. Just a cool, cool lady all the way through. But after she heard that Oscar was wounded in the war, she noted, the whole thing doesn't affect me very much. I don't really believe in his injury. 
stories. I just don't believe in this person at all anymore. She cared much more for Gropius and not only frantically visited him in Berlin when he was wounded, but married him in 1915. She was over Oscar, really. Oscar did not feel the same way. Upon returning to Vienna in 1918 after the war, he was haunted by memories of Alma Mahler. He couldn't stop thinking about her. All of his paintings resembled her, which is especially odd given that they did not when they were actually a couple. During that year, he not only painted, but also wrote the play Orpheus e Eurydice, based, unsurprisingly, on the Greek myth about lost love. It was later adapted into an opera in 1921. It seemed clear that Oscar needed some kind of rebound, lest he become one of those sad-eyed people who just keep talking about the one who got away for years and years afterwards. Most people probably would have rebounded with an actual person, but Oscar was not most people. He wrote to a dollmaker on July 22, 1918, about a very special commission. I am very curious to see how stuffing works. On my drawing, I have broadly indicated the flat areas, the incipient hollows and wrinkles that are important to me. Will the skin? I am really extremely impatient to find out what will that will be like and how its texture will vary according to the nature of the body it belongs to, to make the whole thing richer, tenderer, and more human. And then, on August 20th, please make it possible that my sense of touch will be able to take pleasure in those parts where the layers of fat and muscle suddenly give way to a sinuous covering of skin. <laughs> Oscar wanted to be able to have sex with the doll, but he wanted to court it first. This is the weirdest part, because if I decided to make a doll out of my ex, I'd be really private about it. As someone who has stacked three pillows into a roughly human shape to lie alongside in bed after a breakup, I can see some sort of appeal to this, but my main priority would be making sure absolutely no one knew anything about my doll. Every single letter to the doll maker would be prefaced with, please tell no one about this ever. <laughs> but Oscar did not hide his beautiful new doll friend away. He began taking her out and showing her a nice time. They went on carriage rides. They went to the opera together. They met Oscar's friends at dinner parties. <laughs> we don't know if she met Oscar's mother, but if so, her mo his mother probably did not hate the doll nearly as much as she hated Alma. He even hired a doll, the doll a special maid with whom he began having sex. <laughs> In his memoirs, Oscar writes, with a bucket of casualness. She said she simply wanted to take my mind off thoughts of death. Though her duty was only to act as a lady's maid to my doll, the destined companion of my life, her sound common sense told her that I would be lacking warmth in my bed. <laughs> What's amazing to me is how nice everyone was about his special friend. Not just the maid, but everyone. People speculated very understandably about whether or not Oscar was having sex with his doll. He probably was, because otherwise you don't really need to get so involved with the layers of fat and muscle. And if you just had a dinner party where one of your friends showed up escorting a life-sized doll shaped like his ex, this is probably one of the first things you'd wonder about. <laughs> but while that was known to be the subject of speculation that season in Vienna, nobody actually turned the doll away. When Oscar showed up at parties with his life-size doll, people tried to treat it just as if he'd brought any lady companion. I'm just going to reiterate that if you are anyway eccentric and possessed of a time machine, early 20th century Vienna would be a great era for you. People were really accepting, so much so that Oscar was made a professor at the Dresden Academy of Fine Arts. And yes, the staff presumably knew about the doll, because everyone knew about the doll. Sadly, while certainly accepted by everyone, the doll was never up to Oscar's exacting standards. In his last letter to the doll maker, he wrote, the outer shell is a polar belt or pelt, suitable for shaggy imitation bedside rug rather than the soft and pliable skin of a woman. The, results, uh, the result is, I cannot not even dress a doll myself, which you knew was my intention. <laughs> Let alone array her in delicate and precious robes. Even attempting to pull on one stocking would be like asking a French dancing master to waltz with a polar bear. <laughs> In his defense, the doll was kind of lumpy and did not look particularly like Alma Mahler or Lucretia Borgia or the Mona Lisa or anyone else. It looked like a very large stuffed doll. After all, it's hard to perfectly recreate muscle and flesh and sinew and all the anatomy that he was really banking on. You know, the lady stuff. After letting all his friends get to know the doll, Oscar held a large party. It was a top-notch party. There was free-flowing champagne and wine and a lot of merriment. The doll was in its most beautiful dress for the party, helped by the maid who was sleeping with Oscar, and Oscar toasted everyone. As the night progressed, everyone became drinker and the evening more hilarious, until the gaiety ended abruptly when Oscar smashed a bottle of red wine over the doll's head and beheaded it in front of all the guests. <laughs> So
so we've talked about a mad artist, and there's a, a level of madness that goes into writing a book. So let's talk about your process. How, I mean, of all the bad breakups, you could have written a book about mine, which might be book two. Um, what, uh, how did you narrow these people down? What, what, what was your process? There were some of them that I always knew were going to be in the book. Um, I was never going to write a book about breakups and not include Oscar Kokoschka, because that would be a crazy oversight. And there were a few other ones, like Edith Wharton, that I had been really interested in and that I knew I was going to include. But I also started with a list of about 20 people that I vaguely knew had experienced bad breakups at some point in history. And some of them were really good. Abraham Lincoln would have made a great addition to this. Georges Sand and Chopin um, were another two that were really excellently bad. But I tried to narrow that down by looking to the people who aroused either a great deal of love or a great deal of hate in me. And if I felt really strongly that I wanted to be friends with one of the people in the stories or that I just hated one of these guys and really wanted to talk about why what they had done was very, very wrong, then I definitely wanted to include those. So one of my favorites um, is the father or the grandfather, the great-grandfather of ghosting. Yes. Uh, can you tell me a little bit? Because uh, I think what you said, I said, why did you include this guy? And you said, um, I can't imagine living in a world where I couldn't talk to people about Timothy Dexter. Yeah. Please uh, tell me, tell, bring us into that world. Yeah, um, there are probably three goals to the book. Um, the first is that if you've ever had a bad breakup, this will make you feel like you were no Oscar Kokoschka. You were, you were really fine in comparison. And uh, the second one is probably to make people see that history is funny and weird and accessible and relevant to your everyday life. And the third personal goal is just for me to have more people to talk about Timothy Dexter with. <laughs> so Timothy Dexter is America's first eccentric millionaire. He uh, made a fortune in ways that nobody should ever be able to make a fortune. Like he, at one point he shipped coal to Newcastle just coincidentally when there was a miner strike on. Uh, There's a saying for bad endeavors, which is don't ship coal to Newcastle. Yeah, and he did. Timothy Dexter's the only one that made money off of that ever. Yeah. Um, he also once shipped bed warmers to the Caribbean. Um, it's hot there. You don't need Super hot. You don't need them. You only need them in New England. But the captain of the ship thought there must have been a mistake. So he attached handles to all of the bed warmers. And they ended up being used to ladle molasses once they got there. And they were sold at a great profit. Um, Tim Timothy Dexter did incredibly Timothy well. Timothy Dexter but did in his spectacularly home life. well. In his home life, um, Timothy Dexter was a very, very eccentric man who grew more eccentric as he became a millionaire. He built a giant minaret studded house when everybody else was living in a very tasteful colonial in Newburyport. Um, it had two statues of him on it in addition to 40 other statues. They were all very, very weird. He wrote a memoir that had no punctuation in it. And uh, when he was criticized for using no punctuation, he released a second edition that had three pages of just punctuation marks at the back <laughs> and said that that solved the problem. Um, and in his personal life, he was originally married to this relatively wealthy widow who he probably could have had a very happy bourgeois life with. But um, as Timothy Dexter grew richer and more eccentric, he started telling people that she was a ghost. She was not a ghost. She was very much alive. But he told everyone who visited his house to ignore that cranky spirit. And she was sitting at dinner with them. She was sitting at dinner with them. She was there. Yeah. Eventually, he staged his own funeral and invited 3,000 people. And then, when uh, he saw that his wife was not mourning sufficiently, probably because he told everyone she was a ghost, <laughs> um, he uh, jumped up and began caning her and told her that she should be crying harder. So, Timothy Dexter is just like a wonderful wonderful weirdo. Um, Can we just put out there that he knew she wasn't a ghost because a came go right through a ghost. Yeah, no. He, he, yeah. That's so true, Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, a big takeaway from this book, which you wouldn't expect something entitled the uh, 13 of the worst breakups in history, <laughs> is solace. Mm -hmm. Sort of at the end of every chapter, you manage to leave the reader, like with the Timothy Dexter case, have you been ghosted? Well, not this bad. Mm -hmm. um, and you just sort of, you know, <laughs> um, and and I left feeling 
incredibly upbeat. Um, easily uh, could have been read the other way, that you leave this thinking, love sucks, everybody's evil, especially when they chop up their head, but when they chop your heart in two. Um, how did you avoid that feeling of reading about all these bad breakups in your research. You did point that out to me, I think, as, as I was going along on this book. <laughs> but no, I honestly find this um, very encouraging. I know when I was writing the book, I was kind of questioning whether or not I was just not good at relationships. And maybe, like, maybe this just wasn't for me. And I think it's very reassuring to have perspective from a standpoint of so, so many other people are so much worse. And we'll get to it later. <laughs> Later, but Oscar Kokoschka goes on to have a very happy marriage, like a happy. Don't give it away. Okay. Don't give it away. <laughs> um, but I, I found it very reassuring to know that you know if I like had drunk texted my ex a few times, that's not the worst thing you can do. And you could stab them in the heart with a. Uh, you could tame at them at your fake funeral. Yeah. There, are, there yeah. are a lot of things that you can do that are legitimately terrible. So while you're writing this book and while you're going through your life having breakups as we all do, mm -hmm. um, what what sort of things? give you solace? What do you read? What, what's your what's your chicken soup for the literary soul? What's my it ended badly? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I pretty much always read the same books when I'm going through a breakup. I always read Ovid's love, bo love books because I like knowing that for thousands of years, people have been experiencing the same angry breakup emotions. <laughs> There's a great part in Ovid where his mistress is cheating on him and he's writing about how he's done with her but also he can't believe that she can even get these cool guys but also she wouldn't be able to get any of them if he hadn't dated her first. So really, he's the cool one. Are these texts from Ovid? Like, as they in could, this kind of text? Very well Not on papyrus text from Ovid. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's his love books. It's how to deal with a breakup from Ovid's perspective, which is, like, you're the reason they're cool. Like, you were the magic in that relationship. Uh, so I read Ovid a lot. Um, I always read Eugene Onegin uh, by Pushkin. I think any Russian scholar would tell me that... Um, I do not read it in the way it is intended to be read. But, spoiler, um, Eugene Onegin is about this sexy, rich aristocrat who goes to stay in the country. And there's this young girl with one of the families that's staying next to him who falls in love with him and writes him a love letter. And it's like, I think we could be really good together. And Eugene Onegin's like, no, I'm cool. Like, I'm a cool, rich aristocrat from the city. I'm too good for this. And it ends badly, but it ends with a chapter where years later she has married the richest man in the city and come to live in the city and Eugene Onegin sees her and realizes that he loved her all along yes. and she just walks away. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's a good one. That's like that's some good Russian literature to make you feel better. And I also always read Dorothy Parker, who is just the queen of breakups all the way through. I brought, I brought my favorite Dorothy Parker poem that feels appropriate to the evening? If, yeah. Okay. Um, say my love is easy had. Say I'm bitten raw with pride. Say I am too often sad. Still behold me at your side. Say I'm neither brave nor young. Say I woo and coddle care. Say the devil touched my tongue. Still you have my heart to wear. But say my verses do not scan and I'll get me another man. <laughs> I dig her. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is working backwards. Maybe we should have started at this, but uh, let's let's go back if you'll permit me. Um, you have an interesting bio as an expert on breakups. Um, you wrote a love and sex column for the Post, and you I was going to say were, but you inform me you currently are a dating coach for the hapless. I am not the real dating coach. Got um, it. You're a, a mock date. I Please am, talk about this. I am a, a, a mock. I'm a guinea pig uh, for a professional. Dating, yes for a dating coach's dates where about once a month um, I sit down in a coffee shop and I sit with men who want to learn how to date for about half an hour and the dating coach sits at another table and takes notes on things that they do that are 
are good and things that they do that are sometimes very bad. <laughs> and um, and what's then, the worst? Um, oh no, I don't. They're do so it, nice. They're so, no, it. no, they're so consistently nice. I won't. Um, they're all they're all really nice guys. And I think anybody who's trying to improve in an area that they know that they're not excelling at, they're doing something admirable. So, um, so I think it's nice that they're trying to learn how to be better and not offend women when they're going on a date. I think. Can you be admirable. my dating coach? Because you're really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've done that. And I also spend a lot of time writing for the Post and writing a lot of pieces for their current affairs column about sex and dating and hearing a lot of stories from people. And all of it's made me really sympathetic to people who are dating and out there and getting their hearts broken because once you start talking to people, you realize that we're all kind of in this together and everybody's suffering through heartbreaks and sadness and not wanting to be with the people who want to be with them and wanting to be with people who have no interest in them and I don't know I wanted to write something where people could feel better um, I, and, and it is effective it, it's definitely a uh, you, you, there is solace in knowing mm -hmm. that you're not near a papaya and yeah. um, definitely not uh, Lord Alfred, who's oh, just a lame so guy. Dumb. He's just Why so did dumb. Oscar Wilde like him? I don't know. He thought oh. he was attractive, but he looked like a beagle. Oh, it's always the, the hotties. Worst. He's not even hot. No. He's not he's even hot. Like Look at beagle, his picture. He's said. not even hot. Like a yeah. beagle. Um, so uh, <laughs> we, we read about basically who inspires you, but who inspires you in your real life? Oh, in my personal life, um, my grandmother is a great inspiration who um, who gave me a great love of reading and uh, she's here uh, if, tell us a little bit about your grandma stand up. Um, she used to be a reporter at the Winnipeg Free Press um, I remember being stunned as a child when I was told that she got to talk to Eleanor Roosevelt um, and yeah I think it's um, I remember going to her house and finding all of her books and I am very very appreciative for all of the support that she has given me and really happy that you can... Hi, Grandma. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a completely different tack, but people think that our era is the worst. You know, the sort of selfie vision that we live in, everything <laughs> mitigated by a screen. Uh, nobody wants to pick up a phone call. Everyone wants to text. No one wants to tell you they like you. They just want to swipe right, or mostly they swipe left. And, you know, it's just a, it's a terrible era. Um, but you have make some pretty strong strong arguments why other errors are the worst. I mean, is anybody beheading you at the end of this conversation? <laughs> that's true, that's true. So talk to me, one era in particular you hate. I hate the Victorian age. Yeah. I hate the Victorian age. I think it's the most stupidly romanticized age of all time. And um, it is maybe my personal mission to stop people from thinking that this was like a really lovely, fun time. It wasn't. It was awful. Um, if you wanted to get a divorce as a man, it would cost you upwards of $200,000. There's a character in Dickens that hears this and just concludes well, the sooner I'm dead, the better. Um, if you were a woman you would have to prove extenuating circumstances before you could end your marriage and those extenuating circumstances couldn't be things like but we're really not getting along. They had to be things like my husband's incestuous or bestiality. So uh, during um, the years from 1800 to 1850 four divorces were granted to women trying to initiate them and in two of those cases, the women were able to prove beyond doubt that their husbands were sleeping with their sisters. So there was like definite incest if you wanted to get out of a marriage. And also women had no rights to any property. Uh, if uh, your husband, if you left your husband's home, he was allowed to carry you back by force. So even if you were trying to get out of a marriage with the very low likelihood that you would be able to get a divorce, your husband could basically just say, no, that's not happening. Um, you'd return. You were able to sue your hi husband if he beat you so badly that he endangered your life. But if you went back to him, which again, if you can't have property or a job and he has all the rights to your children is a tempting option, then you were seen by the court as having condoned it and you could never complain again. So yeah, the Victorian age is terrible. The but Victorian age I'm is I'm going to push back a little bit using you, okay. um, which is in your book, you talk about the medieval age and the beauty standards where were absolutely no hair on your face. Uh, I know. So you pluck out your eyelashes? Go, go on about that. A lot of people have brought that up and I'm surprised. I thought everybody knew that. Did 
people just think that yeah, people have really prominent Yeah, we all knew that you pluck out your hairline. In all of those paintings. Wait, explain that. Well, when you look at paintings of women from the Middle Ages, they all have huge foreheads, right? That's because they were plucking back their hair. What? Yeah. Um, it's because the church thought that exposing your hair was too sexy. So um, chaste women would pluck out any excess hair on their face. So it would be things like your eyebrows, your eyelashes sometimes, which is a very bad idea. Your eyelashes are important. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, going a, a, a little bit uh, left to center here, can we talk about another instance in your book when hair was involved maybe in an envelope? Oh, Carolyn Lamb, my <laughs> favorite. Well, she's not really my I have a lot of favorites. Um, Carolyn Lamb chopped off her pubic hair and sent it to her ex-boyfriend, Lord Byron. And she not only sent him her pubic hair, she also, in her letter, said that she hoped that he was going to send her pubic hair back. <laughs> um, that he'd send his own and like... It's I don't like know a Facebook like. I don't know back. how it was going to work. <laughs> like <it's laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they're terrible. She then burnt them in effigy afterwards in a huge bonfire. Wait, her pubes? Oh, no, no. Just, okay. uh, you know, a scarecrow that looks like Byron. Got it. Just burned in effigy and made her servants recite her poetry about how she didn't like Byron while burning him in effigy. So she really took her feelings and owned them and went for it. So you, you talk about that. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that we talk about is how how you can thrive after a breakup. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you told me a bunch of times that you wrote this book for yourself mm -hmm. to really, to tell you that. So, mm -hmm. so talk to me about that motivation. Um, I think that I live in fear of being labeled somebody's crazy ex-girlfriend. And um, also just, you know, I'm, I'm very nervous that after relationships end badly, that it means that the fault's just all with me and I've done everything wrong and I'm not good at this. And... Uh, um, I thought so many of the characters in this book were incredibly resilient and incredibly brave that no matter what happened in the past, they went on and they, in a lot of cases, went on to have wonderful lives. And, and um, they leaned into the crazy is something some we talked did. about. Some of them did. Yeah. Some of them really did, yeah. <laughs> Um, what uh, the one that oh my god the name is escaping me leaned into the crazy um, who she bathed in milk oh my god no. Bobby Sabina yes tell tell me tell uh, me about her well, or she she hated her love rival and then she went and some oh, account yeah. yeah yeah no um she she was Nero's second wife she uh, basically convinced Nero to kill his mother and also Nero killed his first wife for her. didn't work out for her though he ended up killing her as well. So, you know, that's that's the way it pans out when you make somebody kill all of their female family members. Got it. They, you might be one of them. Yeah. Great. Good to know. Um, so, uh, on that note, um, let's uh, dip back. Um, we, we're talking about resilience and about mm -hmm. overcoming, and which this book will help you do. Um, it will inspire and uplift you, mm -hmm. as it has its author. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you don't believe us, um, let's dip back into Oscar Kokoschka, shall we? And see how uh, he and his beheading his sex doll wasn't uh, wasn't f amazingly enough wasn't what he was solely remembered for in his end of days. <laughs> okay, so almost life worked out great. She moves to New York. She has a great time. She parties until her death in 1964 and 84. Um, meanwhile, Oscar is often remembered as Mad Kokoschka. But I think the really important moments in his life took place after the end of his affair. You know that whole thing about Vienna being a wonderful and accepting place where you could be a doll fetishist and a professor at a respectable university? That ended the moment the Nazis came to power. Oscar's work was included in the Nazi Degenerate Art Exhibition of 1937. In response, he painted self-portrait as a degenerate artist. Rather than the kind of antic motion you see in many of Oscar's paintings, in this one, his subjects seem rooted. It's painted in the garden of Ulda Pav Palkowska? Yes, Grandparents, okay. The daughter of a Prague art connoisseur, Ulda was a great supporter of Ar Oscar's work. She and Oscar moved to London together at her insistence shortly thereafter. She seemed to be a good influence. How do we know? Well, the content of Oscar's journals changed dramatically around this time. Instead of being utterly dominated by death, they suddenly focus on how Ulda made excellent meals, including rice pudding and Viennese chocolate cake. There was a movie theater near their house, and they apparently enjoyed going to the cinema. They especially liked Fred Astaire 
Cher and Ginger Rogers movies. The couple were married in an air raid shelter during World War II and lived together happily until his death in 1980. Maybe this could be interpreted as some sort of version of Oscar come to epitomize John Hughes's notion that when you grow up your heart dies. This relation certainly doesn't seem as dramatic and passionate as his affair with Alma, but I think it was good. You could say that maybe all this felt like a consolation prize since Oscar loved Alma so much, but that doesn't seem quite true. Certainly there was always a corner of Oscar's heart that belonged to Alma and remembered that great and wild passion, but that's not the kind of relationship that typically has staying power. Oscar needed someone to go to the movies with and grow old with and make him chocolate desserts. In my favorite picture of them, Oscar is reading a letter while Olda ties his tie for him. His tie matches her dress. Both of them look kind of preoccupied. You don't look at this picture as you might Bride of the Wind and think, what an amazing love scene. But I do not think in a million years Oscar and Alma would have ever had that easy coupley familiarity. I would also point you to another wonderful picture in which Olda seems to be speaking animatedly and Oscar is watching her and smiling. These are normal things. They're not as exciting as stormy passionate affairs, but they're no less meaningful for being normal. Ultimately, I think instead of being swept up in a sex doll beheading fury, most people would choose sitting around and eating rice pudding with someone they love who loves Sam in return. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. On that note, we'll open it up to questions. Hi. How is that? Oh, I'm not, I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> Has uh, grandma helped you with relationships at all? Uh, I, I, maybe by her own happy marriage, she has inspired me in that way. Um, and yeah, I, I think grandma is a source of good advice on many things. Uh, did you write this book to sort of tell women, <laughs> bless you, <laughs> to sort of tell women that, hey, it's not that bad? I think to tell human beings, hey, it's not that bad. I don't want it specifically to be a takeaway for women, but I do think that women get their hearts broken. More than men. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Or are at least more vocal about having their hearts broken. Yeah, on behalf of all men, sorry. <laughs> Cancel the pube mailing. <laughs> Um, are there any passive-aggressive jabs at your own exes, like, embedded in the book? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there could be. And I think Our I'm, exes, by I the way. I think there might have been when I was writing it, but no, I've edited it all out, so all my exes can feel very safe that they are in no way mentioned in any capacity. Other questions? Have you heard from the ex since your book has been released? Oh, um, my exes? Yeah, I've heard from like over 50% of them. Um, I'm friends. Some of them are in the audience. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm have exes who are very wonderful friends and who are great people. So. Oh, oh it connected uh, yeah, her to he her agent. Introduced me to my agent. Yeah, that's why there's a book. Uh, thank, thank God for David. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah. It's good. Uh, yeah. No, he was. I, I had a very good experience with him. It was fine. <laughs> oh, he's there. Oh, hi, Davy. <laughs> <laughs> Which, con congrats, Jen. Um, which, which, which of these chapters would make a good opera that isn't one already? Oh, that's such a good question because I'm always trying to figure out how to turn this into a movie deal. Uh, um, I think uh, the chapter of Emperor Nero would be very operatic. A lot of murder, some castration, terrible things all the way through. Um, a, a lot of a lot of death scenes and a lot of very beautiful women. So uh, I would go with Nero if I was trying to make it an opera. I would go with Timothy Dexter if I was trying to make an amusing comedy starring Will Ferrell. <laughs> <laughs> we can do one or two more questions. If there are any. Uh, I'm wondering, besides you said a lot of power, mm -hmm. kind of drive people crazy, but other than that, any other um, personality traits, any other common threads that you saw between these people? Um, 
that maybe that's a really good edge. question and uh, honestly a lot of them were brilliant a lot of these people were really really smart and had boundless energy it's just unfortunately sometimes they channeled that boundless energy into like insane torture devices <laughs> or um, elaborate revenge plots <laughs> <laughs> One final question to close out the evening. Anyone? Yeah. Since it must have been difficult to uh, contain this to just 13, <laughs> um, will there be a sequel? <laughs> No, I am working on a second book now. Um, it's called Get Well Soon, The 13 Worst Plagues in History. So it's about terrible diseases and why we don't die from syphilis anymore. So in that way, it connects. It connects pretty well. I, I, I have one final question for you. <laughs> Jennifer, can you find love? Of course you can, yeah. Um, I am wildly in love with my boyfriend, who I live with. Hi, Daniel. Um, he's, yeah, he's in the middle of some access. Um, so, yeah, and for me, you know, writing this book was wonderful because it gave me a lot of confidence that even if I do things that are wrong or I screw up, because we met, like, almost to the day that I finished the book. So it, it takes longer to have a book published than to gestate a child. It takes forever. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, we met almost at that exact time. And it was the first time where I'd been able to go into a relationship thinking, like, well, no matter what I do wrong, it's not going to be like these guys. So... <laughs> I guess it's going to be okay. <laughs> Terrific. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here.